That's all. Uh, I'd like to thank Professor Ju for his comments, and uh, I'm very interested when he he said that China is interested in um, sustaining the status quo in the South China Sea, and I suspect that we might, uh, from different countries in South China Sea, we might have different interpretation of the status quo, and I would like to take this opportunity to ask Professor Ju whether he, he might be uh, um, willing to identify uh, what uh, is his definition of the status quo. Because uh, we have observed uh, several incidents of uh, changing the status quo on behalf of China, like in 1974, in 1988, and then in 1995, and then in 2009, uh, continuous uh, actions to change the status quo. So uh, what would you define the status quo now? I think the uh, status quo in the history have got different meanings and different uh, situations. If you look at the situation before 1960s, I don't think there was any dispute. All countries accepted that South China Sea is, Ch is the territory of China. You look at the maps published. You mean the, pub the maps published by the Philippines in 1988? It is still included the Huanyang Island in the territory of China. If you read the letter by Prime Minister Fan Wentong to Chinese minister. Yeah. You will find that. Yeah. That's, in, that's, uh, that's written in white paper and black ink. So that's, uh, you, may have, you may have different understanding. So now the problem is that uh, how to interpret, uh, interpret, how to manage the relationship between the original international laws and the UNCLOS. This is a problem. Uh, this, I, I actually, UNCLOS of uh, brought some difficulties to the issue. And uh, of course, the discovery of oil and petroleum in South China Sea brought on the new, brought the, uh, the differences in this region. I think at the present, maintainers of status quo means that the Chinese do not want to reoccupy all the islands that have been occupied by the other side. And the continuation of the exploration of you of all you you can continue. But no party should increase the occupation over the islands. As we repeatedly cited following the occupation of the islands by different uh, cl claimants. But I, after China's uh, occupation of mischief, I think it has brought to the stability of the situation in this region for such a long time. And since that, I don't think Chinese have uh, carried out any provocative actions. If you look at the dis present dispute over Huayang Island, I think if we call the international laws, five principles were applied to this sort of uh, dispute. One, who discovered first. Second, who gave the name to the island first. Chinese give the name to the island in, 2000, in 1287. What is the name of from, from the Philippines up to now? And who third is the fact that who carry out exploration first? If you look at China's ancient uh, Silk Road on the seat, if you look at the uh, fishery activities of Chinese side, Chinese fishermen lived in this area in fishing for generations after generations. And the second, lastly, I believe that uh, who exercised the jurisdiction and the management over this island. So all this can be clearly, uh, can clearly show the, which country these islands belong to. And lastly, I believe that is the, no party should eat the words they have made or the pledges or the obligations they have committed. So these are the principles of international laws in the past. I know there are contradictions between these two, between the UNCLOS and the previous international laws. Of course, I'm, I'm not an expert on that. But we Chinese try, we Chinese hope to maintain the status quo. 
if you look at the actions of the Philippines, without the kidnap of China's uh, fishermen, without the retaining of China's fish boat, how could Chinese take those sort of actions of retaliation? That's what I, my, I, my, that's my answer to the question. Uh, yes, that gentleman here with the sweatshirt. Yeah. Thank you. Hello? Yeah. Uh, Mel Maskin, uh, Fordham. Uh, the issue of uh, distrust, mistrust, and the connection to what each side perceives as uh, the history to look for. On the one hand, we have Professor Ju who says China has not been uh, offensively minded. Uh, that's, of course, contradicted by uh, the conquest of the non-Han people all throughout its history. Uh, in the Qing Empire, in the dynasty, in the expansion. And then we have uh, Ambassador Hill saying the United States is not interested in non-U.S. sovereignty issues. Of course, when Iraq claimed Kuwait as the 19th province, the United States had a war. So, uh, uh, just a little footnote there, we had a war against that, okay? So we were concerned. So now the question is, uh, well, who to believe? Uh, it's a misrepresentation, though, of the history of both sides. Thank you. Want to discuss the Iraq War now? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think we can do that in 20 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Can't hear you. No, but we're not going to take a position with respect to the sovereignty, dis uh, to the issue of sovereignty with respect to this territorial dispute. Uh, with respect to an invasion of a neighboring country, yes, we do take a position on that. My name is Jeannie Nguyen, good voice of Vietnamese Americans and Vietnamese and Americans. So um, I'm very interested in uh, Dean Ju about Chinese perception of the Southeast Asian Sea, which is the East Vietnamese Sea and the West Filipino Sea. And it's also part of Malaysians and part of Brunei. So um, China, since you claim the nine dash line, like the question was raised, has increased tremendous anxiety in these neighbors. But to Vietnam, I believe Vietnam did not provoke China any time. In 1974, it was China who invaded Vietnam, Paracels Island. And so now if we come to joint venture, can Vietnam share uh, the resource there with China? That would be brotherhood, a sisterhood, right? And um, we, I'm very interested in the fisher, uh, fisheries and the fishing ban that China has uh, implemented in the Southeast Asia Sea, especially in the East Sea of Vietnam. Many Vietnamese fishermen with no weapons were helpless, were killed, was, their ship was sank. So would, would, was that included in your status quo? Would that actions continue? And right, I also we, wanted to ask just we, one we big question. Have time for a long speech. Okay. We have many other people who would like to take part. Yes, sir. So my question is to both Lin Chu and uh, Ambassador Hill, what do you think Vietnam can do to help both China and the U.S. to come to a compromise? Thank you very much. I have never heard the name you mentioned, or used the Vietnamese or what to see. But if, what I read from uh, international publications, that's called South China Sea. By South China Sea, I do not mean that that's, uh, that belongs to, all belongs to South China. As far as the, main, the problem issue you mentioned as China's occupation of uh, uh, Xisha Island, I hope you will read the historical document uh, written by uh, the letter presented to China by your prime minister at that time. So I, I think that uh, we Chinese have no problem, and we are making preparations to maintain the status quo, to maintain peace and stability. As far as the fishery, I think uh, you are sending a lot of fishing boats to Shisha Islands. You, I, I'm really wondering if you are responsible for this issue or not, because I went to the Shisha Islands for quite a few times, and I saw the Vietnamese uh, fish boats there. So I really 
I really, I really wonder if you know the whole story of that. Uh, Thank Professor you. Robert Beckman of National University of Singapore. Yeah, trying to bring it back to U.S. and China interests in the South China Sea. Uh, as I see the problem developing over the last 10 years, it's the question of how the United States, as having been the preeminent naval power in the region, is going to have to get used to a different balance of power, and that China, as a rising naval power, they'll have to be sharing the naval power, as they will be perhaps with India and, and Japan. And one of the difficulties that's presented by China's position of what the U.S. Euphemic calls a euphemism of freedom of navigation is that China is interpreting the economic zone concept in a way to limit U.S. military activities, including reconnaissance activities, which to me was start of the whole pivot or removal to Asia. But when you look at it from China's perspective now, what has happened in the last three years is U.S. has reestablished stronger defense relationships with South Korea, Japan, Philippines, Australia, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, Bruna, uh, Myanmar. And should we be paranoid when Chinese get the view that maybe we're trying to surround it? Uh, perhaps looking at it, they would see that this seems to be what exactly what's happening. But my long-term question is for Professor Zhu. As a rising naval power, you are going to like Spain and Portugal and England and every naval power are going to want the same liberties that the United States Navy has wanted in five or ten years from now. You're going to want to conduct the same activities off the coast of India or Japan that the United, Nation, the United States now insists it has the right to do off your submarine base in Hainan. But as I see it, you are still acting like a middle-level country who's frightened by a big bad navy when five years from now you're going to be the big bad navy threatening other people. So there's a time lag between the time your interests change and your policy changes. And when will that time lag be filled? 